We'll be discussing a bit more details on what FNH uh, topics are covered within the program. And so before we get started, and so before we get started, um, we'll do a land acknowledgement. So I'll just move that on to the next slide. All right. Justice. All right, so um, within Atlanta Acknowledgements, uh, we're presenting to you from UBC's Vancouver West Point Great Campus. Uh, UBC's Vancouver campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. Uh, this land and its rightful peoples have given us all the opportunity to continue to learn, grow, and explore our world. And I myself am very grateful to be able to study, work, and play on this land that has been cared for for thousands of years before me. And so land acknowledgments, land acknowledgments are a way of giving recognition and gratitude to the First Nations, um, Inuit, and Métis land that we are gathered on. And so by giving a land acknowledgement, um, settlers take the very basic and fundamental step on the way to reconciliation between the Indigenous peoples and settlers. Um, however, we know that land acknowledgements go far beyond just acknowledging whose land you're on. To truly comprehend the importance of a land acknowledgement, one would need to do research on the historical trauma that has affected Indigenous peoples and what effects still hold on to Indigenous peoples today. And so land acknowledgements are something you'll hear more often during your time in UBC. All right, next slide, please. And so we'll do a brief introduction of who we are. And so my name is Ayasha. Uh, I'm in fourth year and I'm taking a Bachelor's of Science in Food, Nutrition and Health uh, with a major in Nutritional Sciences. And so I basically learned about topics that of how food is processed in our body and how it may relate to diseases and how we can prevent these diseases from forming within our nutrient intake. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bree Jacobson. I am one of the academic advisors here in the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. Uh, so as an academic advisor, I work with all of our current undergraduate students from the time that you are first considering uh, our programs um, all the way up until the time that you graduate um, on all sorts of matters related to your degree. So I am one of the faces um, that you would potentially be interacting with um, when you are a current student in our programs. Okay, and so now that you know a little bit about uh, who we are, um, we'd love to learn a little bit about who you are and where you are joining us from. Um, so if you could go ahead and use the Zoom chat feature um, to type in where you're joining us from. Um, we'd love to learn where in the world you are today. Oh, amazing, welcome from Mexico. Some Vancouver, Richmond, lots and local areas in BC here. Toronto, welcome, it's a little bit later. Awesome, lots from BC. Well, great, thank you all for joining us today, wherever in the world you are joining us from, we're happy to have you here. Okay, so um, we are here to talk today about the Food, Nutrition and Health Program, but I'd like to begin by just talking about our faculty uh, in general. Um, so the Food, Nutrition and Health Program is part of the Faculty of Land and Food Systems. It is a faculty that you don't often find in other universities. So I'd like to break this down a little bit more. So we are one of the science faculties here at the University of British Columbia. All of our degrees are Bachelor of Science degrees, um, but we focus on science with a social impact. Um, so what this means is that our science is applied to concepts which are very important for the world today. Um, issues related to um, human health and sustainable food supply. So some of the benefits of being in our program are that we do really focus on addressing those local and global issues, including food security, human health and nutrition, land use and animal welfare. 
we are also one of the smaller faculties at UBC. So you get the benefits of being part of a very large research institution while also being part of a smaller tight-knit community of staff, faculty, and students. Um, and then we also have that very applied focus in our faculty. So we really take it to heart um, and we believe that students learn most effectively um, and build their career while they are doing integrated learning, practical labs, field trips, when they're working directly with campus and community partners um, throughout their degree and learning through uh, for credit internships and career experiences. So uh, what are we going to be talking about today? Today, our primary focus is going to be on uh, the Food, Nutrition and Health program. Um, so I'm going to be uh, starting us off today with a bit of an overview of what Food, Nutrition and Health is and why you might consider that um, as one of your programs uh, to select in your application for UBC. Um, I'll then be talking about the Food, Nutrition and Health majors. So once you are part of the Food, Nutrition and Health program at UBC, what kind of majors can you declare to further specialize within our faculty? Um, I'll then be handing it off to uh, my colleague Ayasha, um, who will be going through a case study so that you can understand what it might be like to actually be studying in Food, Nutrition and Health. Um, we are also going to be joined today um, by some great uh, a faculty member and a couple great alumni of our faculty to speak to their experiences um, as members of this program. Uh, and then we'll wrap up today with a little bit of admissions overview. We know that students always have questions around admissions. Um, so don't worry if you have questions about admissions. Um, we have a dedicated section to speak to that at the end. Um, and then we'll end today with a Q&A session. Um, so I just ask that if you do have questions, um, if you could leave those to the end. Um, we'll just be using the Zoom uh, chat to answer any questions. So um, we'll just be saving those to the end um, to avoid any interruptions as we go along. Okay, so before I get started uh, to tell you a little bit about food, nutrition, and health, I'm curious um, to learn about what you think about uh, when you hear food, nutrition, and health. What comes to your mind uh, when you think food, nutrition, and health? And just use that Zoom uh, chat function again to type in your answers. Farms. Yeah, absolutely. Where our food comes from. That is a very fundamental part of food, nutrition and health. Healthy eating, our diet, how your diet impacts health. Yep. Diet is being the key to a healthy lifestyle. These are all great concerns. And absolutely, every one of those topics are topics that are covered within the food, nutrition and health program. So food, nutrition, and health um, is really, oh, sorry, I went a little bit too far. Um, food, nutrition, and health really spans topics um, related to the production and processing of food through to the marketing and the consumption of food and what happens to those nutrients when they reach our body and how they impact our health. Um, so this degree integrates technical understanding of human metabolism. That's where the science um, comes in. All of our students receive a very foundational um, knowledge into the science um, behind what is going to be happening in your body. Um, but it also brings in some of those social concepts, the, uh, the global food markets um, and their intersection with the chemical compositions of food. Everything is... Um, looked at holistically in this program. Um, it also explores the impact food has on individual and community health, um, as well as looking at real world, world applications of um, health sciences to healthcare, food policy and food production. Uh, then um, it also builds adaptability, um, communication skills and cultural competencies. So a lot of our uh, programs uh, within the faculty, um, they really integrate a lot of those career development skills directly into our courses. 
um, it gives you a foundational understanding of science and how to apply that knowledge and and hands-on experience. So as I mentioned, we all have, um, the, all of our programs are science degrees. So you are gonna build those find foundational science skills, um, but then you do still uh, build that knowledge into um, hands-on experiences in all of your courses. Um, and then a lot of our uh, courses um, also build in work with community partners um, so that you can then um, apply what you are learning in your classroom to solve real world problems um, that are actually going to impact real people um, in real time. Okay, um, so within uh, food, nutrition and health, um, there are a number of different majors that you can then uh, declare to further specialize within your program. Um, so those majors include our food, nutrition and health major. Um, so this is uh, sometimes we refer to this as our FNH general major. Um, you can specialize in food, uh, nutritional sciences, food science, our food and nutritional sciences double major, as well as our dietetics major. So I'll be going over those in detail now. Um, all of the majors that we offer um, have uh, offer a flexible and foundational degree in science, nutrition, and food science. So regardless of what major you choose, you are getting uh, that flexible foundational degree. Um, they'll all help you gain a deeper understanding of population and public health. Um, and they'll all integrate concepts of exploring local and global food systems and their effects on human health. Okay, so um, breaking down each of the majors that you could potentially select while you are in food, nutrition and health. Um, the first one that I wanna talk about is the general major in food, nutrition and health. Um, so this major uh, gives you the greatest flexibility in creating the program that you want. Um, so just like all of the major options, you'll get the same foundational science in the first um, and second year. Um, but this major in particular offers you a lot of elective opportunities to specialize in areas that you are most interested in. Um, so you can really develop the um, program and academic that reflects your passions. Um, you'll also gain a deeper understanding of issues relating to food production, food security, and the role of nutrition in disease prevention. Um, nutritional sciences, on the other hand, um, is a little bit more um, um, planned out. Um, so this major really offers a comprehensive understanding of nutrition and its relation to human health sciences and human metabolism. So it integrates more of those foundational science courses, particularly in second and, and third year, while really focusing on the um, process of how nutrients are um, uh, digested and processed in your body and the effects on human health, disease, and public health, um, as well as uh, human metabolism and nutrient utilization in the body, um, and a uh, really great focus on applied nutrition and disease prevention. So for students who are particularly interested in getting um, into um, research fields, um, human medical fields or um, public health related to nutritional sciences, um, going on to further graduate work, um, nutritional sciences really sets you up for success in those areas. Um, but speaking about career opportunities, um, as an academic advisor, I often get the, the question, um, from students of, okay, well, what jobs can I get with this major versus this major? Um, what can I do uh, if I specialize in food, nutrition, and health versus what can I do if I specialize in nutritional sciences? Um, the answer is that there, there aren't any particular careers that you can only get with one of those majors. It really is shared. A lot of the career opportunities are shared between food, nutrition and health and nutritional sciences. Um, the main differences are in the flexibility of the course offerings um, and the, um, the, the type of focus of the courses that you're gonna be taking, particularly in your third and your fourth year between these two majors. Um, so examples of what students have done after they have completed um, food, nutrition, and health in either of these major specializations 
um, food service management, lab technician, um, people have gone on to work in public policy, um, human medicine, public health nutritionist. Um, these are all definitely possible within either of these majors uh, in the food nutrition and health program. And again, I like to say to you that this is not an exhaustive list. Um, these are possibilities and these are examples of where alumni within these majors have um, ended up um, after completing their degree. Okay, so moving on to other major possibilities. Um, so the previous two majors that I discussed are what we call non-competitive majors. So they are majors that students can freely declare without filling out any application or needing to meet any particular criteria to select. Um, now we're moving on to some of our competitive majors. Uh, all of these majors that I'm gonna be talking about now, they will all require an application um, and you would need to meet certain admission criteria in order to be selected for these competitive majors. Um, so the first one is food science. Um, so food science really focuses on the um, production and manufacturing of the food um, and food safety. So focuses on the chemical and biological aspects of food processing and production, as well as um, the application of engineering to mechanical food processing. Um, so how is our food produced how do we package it in a safe way? How do we avoid that bacteria from getting in and potentially making people sick? How do we make our food tastier, crunchier, more satisfying to eat? Um, those are all questions that our food scientists um, really uh, look at in our program. Um, we are one of the leading uh, food science um, faculties and programs in the world. Um, and we are um, just, getting new facilities every day um, to allow our students uh, to work in even more advanced uh, food science um, spaces. So that's really exciting. Um, this is also uh, a space where students get a lot of really practical laboratory skills. Um, so if you are interested in working in a lab setting, um, our students in the food science major get a lot of that hands-on lab experience um, and uh, lots of opportunities to potentially engage in both research, um, as well as explore some of our community partners um, engagement opportunities through like our co-op program um, by working with uh, community partners. Uh, so career opportunities within the food science space. Um, these are uh, potential examples. Um, so working as a food analysis technician, uh, quality assurance, product development, uh, research and development, um, working for food companies or working for um, government organizations to ensure that our food um, is, is safe. These are all examples of um, things that you can look forward to after uh, completing your degree. Okay, so then moving on to our uh, double major. So our double major combines our food science major with our nutritional sciences major. So if you are somebody who is interested in both the um, safe production and manufacturing of food, as well as what happens to that food when you consume it and what happens um, to human health and the, and the intersections of those concepts, then the double major might actually be right for you. Um, so this combines uh, courses within both of those majors. Um, it is a bit of an extended degree, so you'll be studying for five years instead of uh, four, um, but then you will end up with that double major and that extended uh, knowledge base. Um, so you'll be studying food chemistry analysis, quality assessment at the same time that you'll be exploring the nutritional composition of food, nutrient metabolism um, and assessment. Oops. And um, career opportunities um, in this space, um, really you're combining the knowledge of of both the food science and the nutritional sciences major. Um, so you could do things like being a nutrition educator, um, consumer um, product officer, food um, product development, working in research and development quality assurance manager. Okay, and then our last major uh, that students can select in the food nutrition and health program is dietetics. 
Um, so dietetics is again, a competitive major. Um, so this is uh, actually a professional degree. So students who complete uh, the degree in uh, Bachelor of Science in Food Nutrition and Health, specializing in dietetics, will actually um, end up being eligible to become a registered dietitian uh, in the province of British Columbia. So uh, this allows students to uh, then become a registered dietitian and work directly with uh, patients in healthcare settings. So in hospitals, in clinics. Um, and this is the only way um, that uh, as a student can become a registered dietitian and work directly with patients is um, by receiving a degree um, in dietetics. We are the only program uh, in British Columbia um, that qualifies students to become a registered uh, dietitian um, here in BC. Um, we have both an undergraduate offering as well as a graduate offering. So we're just speaking about the undergraduate uh, offering today. Um, so students who go through the dietetics program, um, you're learning how to support individuals in food and nutritional choices, specifically from a healthcare perspective. So students who uh, complete this degree and go on to become a registered dietitian, you may be working with um, patients in healthcare settings who may need further support with their um, dietary plans. They may have specific dietary needs um, that relate to their human health and dietitians help guide uh, those patients through that process. Um, this is a extended degree as well. Um, so students who complete the dietetics uh, major will be completing a minimum of five years uh, to complete their program. Um, so from the time that you are accepted into the dietetics major, you will be completing uh, three years um, in order to complete your degree. But unlike other uh, some other dietetics uh, majors that you may find in other places, our program incorporates both the coursework that's required to become eligible to become a registered dietitian, as well as the um, practicum elements. Um, so to become a registered dietitian in Canada, you do need um, actual experience in a healthcare setting. Our major incorporates both the practical experience that you need um, in order to get fully registered, as well as the, the course and core content that you need. Okay, so career opportunities, um, clearly becoming uh, a clinical dietitian um, in a hospital or health clinic um, is, a, is a pretty obvious choice, but some of our dietitians do choose to work more on the public health side. Um, they may be doing private practice. Um, some of them have gone on to um, have uh, be um, on TV and have um, TV programs or um, to be um, publishing uh, cookbooks or, or spreading their knowledge um, in other ways. Um, and then um, both in um, kind of public healthcare settings as well as um, private settings are going on to research. Okay, so um, that's a very academic advising kind of perspective on our, our programs. Um, and I'm obviously speaking um, to you as an academic advisor about our majors. Um, but I want to turn it over now to Ayasha so that you can learn a little bit more about what it is like to actually be um, studying while a student in FNH. Thank you, Bree. On to the next slide, please. Thank you. All right, so to give you a taste of what the coursework is like in FNH, uh, we're going to do a case study on the topic of nutrition transition and human health. Right. And so uh, before we get started, I'm going to open up a poll and ask you have you heard about any concepts in relation to nutrition transition? So I'll launch that poll. I'll give it around a minute just to have everyone's participation.
Okay, so I'll end the poll. And so uh, there is a 100% rate that none of you guys have heard about the concept in nutrition and transition. So this is perfect for what I'm gonna introduce later today. And so before I define what nutrition transition is, I would like to touch upon how um, LFS courses talk about the nutrition transition. So in the LFS course series, uh, which includes a course set of courses you take throughout your undergraduate degree, uh, this includes LFS 100 that you take in your first year, um, LFS 250 in your second year, and then LFS 350 in your third year. Um, we explore many integrated concepts and in how they relate to the global food systems and systems thinking. So uh, I remember in Alphys 250, we talked about nutrition transition, and this was a foundation, foundational concept to many other topics we explored, uh, such as sustainability in agriculture, uh, food security and sovereignty, uh, and animal welfare. So really understanding the main drivers of our food system is key to also understanding why we face diet-related diseases and changes in our food system uh, supply. And so uh, the nutrition transition describes the shift in dietary consumption and energy expenditure uh, expenditure that is driven by diets shifting towards highly processed foods. And so highly processed foods include uh, foods high in sugar, uh, fat, salt, and low in fiber. So one of the most notable results of the nutrition transition is the increasing prevalence of obesity and chronic diseases. So chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, um, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cancer are one of the um, diseases that are prevalent in nutritional intake and the nutritional transition. All right, so there are five stages of the nutrition transition that I'll touch upon. Um, the five being hunter-gatherers, uh, agricultural advancement, uh, industrialization and modernization, the emergence of non-communicable diseases, also known as chronic diseases, and then the last one being behavioral changes in populations. So let's take a look at these five stages a bit more closely. Um, just to pinpoint, the larger a proportion of countries are at stage three and beyond. But before I touch upon that, I would like to define the first two stages of the nutrition transition. So in hunter-gatherers, you kind of can think of this as like the caveman concept. Um, it's where individuals uh, live highly active lifestyles due to their hunting uh, practices and for foraging food. So their diets uh, consist of amounts of uh, fibrous plants, which are high in fiber, and lean wild animals, which are high in protein. And so in the second stage uh, is agriculture advancement. Um, so this is usually shown uh, after a famine has receded and then income rises. So when income rises, they usually would set aside monetary means to purchase nutrients, dense foods and help improve their overall nutrition status. Right. And moving on. So the third stage is the industrialization and modernization of food systems. So in the diet, you would see a decrease in starchy vegetables consumption. So foods that are high in energy intake, such as potato, um, root vegetables that are related to potatoes. So that could be sweet potato as well. And also an increase in fruits, vegetables, and animal proteins. Um, there's also a little variety within the diet and this is influenced by advances in the agricultural and household tools. And so um, when you consume this in your diet, the health status is that you'll have continued, uh, you may have continued maternal and child health problems. And this is due to the decrease in starchy vegetables. So um, with mothers and with chittle, chittle, children, sorry, um, they tend to have a higher demand in energy intake uh, for nutrients. And so if you decrease that starchy vegetable consumption, um, problems within uh, health problems may occur within the children and uh, mothers. And there's also a large decrease in nutritional deficiencies. And this is due to the increased consumption of fruits, vegetables, and animal protein. Uh, you may also have an increased uh, stature. So this may also be evident due to meeting your nutrient intake that comes from fruits, uh, vegetables, and animal protein. So moving on to the next stage is stage four, uh, which is the emergence of non-communicable diseases, also known as chronic diseases. 
And so um, in the diet, you would see an increase in sugar, uh, processed foods and fats, especially from animal products and a decrease in fiber consumption. Um, a lot of countries now are in this stage. Um, a good example is in the US where their food portions and fast food chains are much larger than the average um, of what a human consumes. And so this is influenced by the mechanization of labor and service jobs. And so um, most likely in the US, they have a lot of uh, service jobs that provide these processed foods. And so your health status within this population uh, is a more increase in obesity, uh, diabetes and heart disease and a decrease in bone health in the elderly because you're consuming uh, foods that are highly processed um, and that have a high increase in sugar and fats and so moving on to the next stage is stage five. So behavioral changes in population. And so to counteract stage four, which are a high consumption in processed foods, you want to improve your diet. And so uh, a lot of people in this within this population increase have an increase in higher quality fat consumption, a decrease in refined carbohydrates consumption, and an increase in whole grains and fruits and vegetables. So they're trying to improve their diet by having a wide variety of different whole grains, uh, fruits and vegetables to really get those um, vitamins and nutrients and essential amino acids. And so this is influenced by the mechanized service sector and also an increase in leisure activities. So this can include going to the gym, um, or playing just sports in general, or even going on a walk. So for example, playing soccer, going on a swim, or just going on casual walks along the neighborhood are um, pieces of, of leisure activities that you can uh, participate in. And so uh, the health status within this population, uh, they have a reduction in body fat and obesity uh, due to the increase in higher uh, nutrient-dense nutrient -dense foods. And they also have an improvement in bone health. So, for example, in Canada, you may have seen the rise or popularity of plant-based foods. And this is because they want to try to get out of that stage four of where a lot of uh, the population are, con are consuming highly processed foods. So, for example, uh, you'd see a lot of advertisements in uh, plant-based patties, patties or plant-based milks, and a lot of um, promotion in health products as well. So moving on, um, another facet uh, of this topic is the triple burden of malnutrition. So what is the triple burden of malnutrition? It is the coexistence of undernutrition, uh, which is stunting and wasting. So stunting is defined as a low height for their age. So for example, you would see a group of friends that are all the same age, but you may see one individual that significantly shorter than the others. Uh, this is a example of stunting. And an example of wasting is you would see a very, um, very skinny person or child. And so another uh, contribution to the triple burden of malnutrition is micronutrient deficiencies. Um, this is known as hidden hunger because it's not as um, evident uh, compared to macronutrient deficiencies. Uh, we also have overnutrition, which is uh, shown in obesity. Uh, individuals who are obese and chronic diseases within a population. And so the triple burden of malnutrition is common in countries that are rapidly um, industrializing. And so people face different health issues within the same region, uh, city, or sometimes even within a single household. So for example, you may see a mother who is obese with a child that is wasted, also known as being very skinny within the same household. And so moving on, what is the significance of um, the nutrition transition? And so ne uh, some negative impacts on the nutritional transition is decreased diet quality, um, increased mortality rates, and increased health care costs to help um, really address those problems that are from uh, highly processed foods and nutrient intake. So a question to ask all of you, uh, what are some ways that we can help prevent these negative outcomes in our diet? So if you want to um type your answers into the chat please feel free to do so what are some ways we can help increase our uh our diet to make it more healthy or to really increase the nutrient variety within our foods uh 
Um, yes, that's one of, I, I have an answer in the chat that's talking about chronic diseases related to the stomach. Um, the disease you mentioned, ulcer ulcerative colitis is one of them, yes, that can be impacted by the diet. So I also have education and support for families to learn about healthy cooking. Yes, um, nutrition education is something we want to emphasize uh, to help really learn, to help give them options and to help um, really know about which foods are really um, nutrient dense or which are good for healthy cooking and how they can spread that to their families. Any more inputs? No? Okay, so uh, I'll be discussing some ways we can prevent these outcomes. So moving on. Um, one of them is making uh, food choices. So choices are made based on personal preference, uh, convenience, dietary restriction, moral reasoning, reasoning such as religion, and factor-based limitations. And so these are influenced by factors including accessibility, availability, and affordability. So these decisions are really complex. And so it is important to acknowledge the relationship between circumstance and choice. Uh, there are many external factors as described by the nutrition transition that influence food markets around you. So then of, of course, so, the, so then of course, as a consumer, um, it is your choice as to what you want to purchase and eat. So sometimes you do truly have the choice to select the foods you want coming from organic and local produce, as well as freshly prepared meals, fruits, and vegetables. And so I'll be discussing a brief example. So for example, let's talk about um, the living in Vancouver versus rural BC. So in Vancouver, you have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, antibiotic free meat, vegetarian alternatives, different cultural foods, and a variety of food retailers, meaning you have many options. Um, we aren't limited by a demographic means, a location or accessibility as the people who live in rural communities where it is difficult to efficiently transport fresh foods or consistently offer those healthy, healthy products. And so something to emphasize, uh, food choices are not solely uh, influenced by what we want to eat, but rather uh, what we have access to and what we have learned about nutrition. So touching upon the comment that was given, um, nutrition education is fairly uh, fundamental to the food choices that we make. All right, and next I'll be discussing, uh, it's also another topic is understanding the effects on human health. So our personal knowledge, understanding, and experience is a key factor in the choices we make and they have direct effects on our overall well-being. Uh, social determinants of health dispropor disproportionately affect rural and marginalized communities. So understanding these uh, external factors that influence our food really help us understand how and why human health become so complicated. Uh, the severity of many diseases is directly related to nutritional imbalances in our diet. And in FNH, uh, you explore the foundations of nutrition and the relationship between human health, metabolism, and external factors. All right, and so we have seen increased rates of obesity, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, and arthritis, also known as chronic diseases, that are closely linked to dietary intake. So understanding the external factors that influence our food choices really help us understand how and why human health becomes so complicated. All right, so next I'll touch upon food quality and the nutritional status and how we can improve on our food quality and food choices. Um, so foods higher in simple sugars may cause spikes in blood sugar levels that induce quick peak quick peaks and valleys in our hunger cycle. Uh, foods higher in salt, such as um, processed foods, uh, also in chips, as well as another example that is high in salt, can increase blood pressure. Uh, foods higher in saturated fats lead to inflammation, high cholesterol, and increased risk for heart disease. So some examples of saturated fats are evident in lard, uh, butter, margarine, and coconut oil. So studying uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins within the context of human metabolism and health is really interesting. Uh, it's something that I also learned within the nutritional science major. 
And so a lot of our focus is how um, our body uses those macronutrients, uh, metabolizes them, and how they are related to disease. So if you're more interested in the food science realm, uh, you might be interested in the level of quality of these nutrients and how processing uh, these foods can change the relative nutrition status. All right, so uh, learning about the mechanisms by which our body uses uh, a fat, for example, for energy storage or how proteins are broken down into amino acids for tissue repair and the importance of fiber really reinforces this holistic um, understanding of health that is essential to being able to help people navigate their nutritional health and choices. So studying in FNH allows you to answer these questions like, what are the consequences of low fiber diets? Uh, what is the difference between saturated, polyunsaturated, and monosaturated fats? And how does a mother's nutritional habit um, influence gene expression in a developing child? And so um, foods lower in fiber are not as filling and over time can have a negative health effect on your digestive system. So ideally you'd want to have foods um, that are high in fiber to really help your gut and to help with the movement of your bowel system. And healthy is a vague term and consumers don't always know which food choices are the best. So moving on, um, what do positive models look like? So some positive models of stage five of the nutrition transition include the emphasis on consumption and preparation of traditional foods, um, also improved food pricing and labeling policies, which is something Canada is trying to improve upon, as well as increased education about nutrition and food. So a lot of the countries that are situated within stage four are really trying to emphasize um, healthy eating to really get out of that stage of highly processed um, food intake. So moving on. Um, overall, an understanding of human health is not limited to knowing all the metabolic pathways or different types of nutrients um, or how our nutritional habits influence gene expression. It is also rooted in a holistic understanding of the external um, internal factors that influence what is available to you. Um, influence what foods you choose to eat or how your body metabolize, metabolizes them and how uh, these nutrients affect your overall health. Um, so this is the foundation, foundational ability to apply a systems thinking approach. So something that ALFES is very, um, very emphasized about. Uh, we like to use system th th use systems thinking approach in our learning. Uh, in your upper years specifically of your undergraduate degree, uh, we also learn how to identify those connections and apply systems thinking in your first and second year where you develop key skills that allow you to use your knowledge in unique ways and apply it to complex uh, food system issues. So that is near the end of our nutritional uh, transition case study. Do you have any thoughts or questions about the nutrition transition? You can also type that into the chat. It could be also any questions about um, nutrient intake or your diet. All right, there seems to be no questions, but something I would like to share is a fun misconception about coconut oil. Um, so coconut oil is advertised as a healthy oil, but in reality, it's actually high in saturated fat. And saturated fat uh, leads to high risk of uh, cardiovascular diseases. And so um, it's I would recommend not really eating coconut oil just because it's high in saturated fats, um, but you can use it for, for other methods such as um, moisturizing your skin. Uh, a healthier oil, for example, is canola oil. It's not as high in saturated fats. Um, something that I would like to share is my personal experience within the nutritional sciences major. Um, initially, I was actually not in the nutritional sciences major. In my first year, I was actually in general sciences. And so, uh, in my, when I wanted to transition into second year, I was thinking that science, the science major 
um, it was a bit too broad for me and I wanted to focus more on the health concepts regarding um, science, especially uh, within the body. And so when I found LFS and how they discussed about um, nutrition, I thought this was the perfect fit for me. So I actually transferred out of science in my first year and transferred into LFS where I love everything that I learned within nutritional sciences. So if you do have any questions in relation to nutritional sciences or, 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 or certain life experiences, please um, uh, please say it in the chat or you can also send me an email as well through the ambassador email. All right, so next we'll have the great opportunity to talk to some of our own LFS alumni and a professor. So I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves and then you can ask any questions you have um, but I'm going to emphasize that please have, uh, please focus your questions on student experiences or their careers rather than academic questions, as we'll leave that towards the end. So the first alumni that we have, her name is Shaktiraj uh, Kandola. She graduated with a double major in food, nutrition and health and education. So I'll pass the floor on to her to talk about her experiences within FNH and the career that she is pursuing. Awesome. Thanks, Ayasha. Um... Hi, my name is Shakti. I teach at a public school in uh, Surrey in around Guilford area. I graduated very recently, actually, just this May to 2023 from uh, LFS with my Bachelor's of Science of Food, Nutrition and Health, as well as the Bachelor's of Education uh, specialized in secondary education. Um, so this is a degree that I kind of found out about through academic advising in my second or third year. Um, and, and I was able to kind of build my courses to allow me to apply in for the dual degree um, through the FNH general major streamline. Um, yeah, it, it took me about, I started in 2017. I originally came into the faculty actually wanting to go into dietetics, but through, you know, experience and academic classes and a little bit of volunteer, I realized that wasn't really my passion. But uh, the great thing about this uh, FNH degree is it's very flexible and it allows you to uh, explore other career interests and options while you're still continuing your studies. You don't have to switch a whole different degree or, or go somewhere else because it allows you to build. Um, so my third year, uh, I applied into the uh, dual degree program and I just finished up recently. And thankfully, there's a lot of jobs for teachers nowadays. <laughs> so if you want to become a teacher, it's a great time. There's They're hiring like no tomorrow. Um, yeah, I teach uh, sciences, textiles, foods, uh, careers as well as Punjabi because it's my language that I speak. Um, but yeah, that that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thank you for sharing, Shakti. Um, does anyone have any questions for Shakti? You can also put them in the chat, just about her career or anything within FNH. I'll give a minute just to see if anyone else has is typing for their questions. I uh, will also add, um, completely forgot to talk about it until right now, um, <laughs> through the degree opportunity through some of the courses that I took, I took a class FNH 371. It's called Human Nutrition Over the Lifespan. Uh, with a professor black and through that experience i was also able to to actively be involved in research as well where we're looking at food care which is measuring care through um taking care of others and we're kind of focusing it in on um smaller children school age children six to twelve ish so there are multiple opportunities for you to go into research into teaching into bunch of, bunch of different things and do them all at the same time Great, thank you. FNH three seventy one is also one of my favorite courses. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no questions in the chat, I do have a question for you. Um, so, how was it like balancing a dual degree in education and FNH on top of all the extracurriculars you had as well? Uh, not easy, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. I, I I think 
sometimes, you know, the things that are best worth it are hard or you got to work hard for it. But um, the way the program is, is outlined is it actually gives you an advantage compared to other people who decide to go into education after they finish their degrees because it provides you with more practicum experience than a normal 11 month program would provide if you were doing your diploma of education. Um, so the degree itself was planned out quite well in terms of each semester was around four, sometimes five classes where you were balancing um, a majority education and then a couple F and H. And then the next semester would be flipped where you were doing majority F and H courses and then a couple education courses. And then in the summertime, you were spending uh, the first semester doing your practicum experience. And then after that, you move on to education courses for the second semester of summer. And then it just kind of repeats for about two years until you're done. But the way it's balanced is is makes it a little bit more manageable. But it is a lot of hard work. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And one last question, a piece of advice you'd give to the pr prospective students that are attending today. Cool. Um, <laughs> Don't be afraid to try it. If it's a degree path, if it's a, a career opportunity, a volunteer experience, a community to join, uh, doesn't matter if you end up at, at any university whatsoever. Um, it's important to, especially nowadays when people are very much confined. As 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 a high school teacher, I see a lot of high school students combined to their their personal bubbles and interests and their cell phones, especially. <laughs> um, Go outside of your bubble and, and push yourself into your uncomfortable zone and try new things. And you might find a, a passion of yours or a career path of yours that you didn't realize was there before. Perfect. Thank you so much, Shakti. Oh, I have a direct question. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, what inspired you to combine your f &H degree with education and how long was your degree in total? Um... What inspired me to combine it was honestly a couple of things. <laughs> um, you finish a little bit uh, quicker than if you were to do your four year program and then the 11 month program by about a three or four months. It also saves you some courses that you have to take if you were to do your education degree separately because it's a little bit uh, less expensive. <laughs> so because there's course overlap between the two um, and Honestly, you get to do it with a cohort of like, there's not a lot of people in this program. So there was about three or four of us that entered in at the same year. And we took all of our classes from year three upwards until we graduated together. So doing it in a cohort was really good and, and, and beneficial in terms of like, we had a very consistent support group because university classes are until you get to like fourth year or fifth year it's a bunch of random people every time so it was nice to have a little bit of consistency through the chaos um it took me in total five five almost five years <laughs> almost five years to complete it thank you for sharing also something to emphasize um the new normal for when uh, you attend university, a lot of people actually graduate within five to six years instead of the four. Just to put that out there. All right, so moving on to the next, um, we have another alumni. Her name is Marielle De La Cruz. Uh, she graduated with a degree in food, nutrition, and health. So I'll pass the floor on to her to talk about her career and outside curricular activities. Yeah, so I graduated, um, oh, hi everyone, I'm Mariel, graduated with an ethnic degree, just like I also just mentioned. And uh, I had a great experience in the LFS faculty, especially with this major. I came into the faculty and when I saw my choices, I knew for sure I wanted to do FNH major because I wanted to build my classes. Uh, I wasn't too dead set on anything yet. I wasn't, I was really interested in nutrition. I still am. I love learning about the body, the different chemicals that go in, um, a little bit about food science and all of that. But we actually ended up driving to a career outside of uh, a set of sciences was the different built in courses within the faculty, the cohorts that you do. So I think I forget it's land and community 
course, it's called like LFS 100, 150, 250, 350. And you take these, it's a, ma it's a mandatory course that you take with pretty much the same people because you're, you're a smaller faculty. Um, you do get to see them a lot and there's a lot of community there. And then those courses, you learn more things outside of just your nutritional courses. So I got to learn a little bit about public health, social justice issues and things like that. I also had a great interest in animal welfare, so I didn't want to choose a career that would limit me to either nutrition or or just animal welfare. Um, and so just by joining this faculty, I had such a great support system here. I cannot say that enough. Our LFS supervising is amazing. I joined uh, this LFS academic career and engagement group when I was in my undergraduate um, because of that, I had access to our great student engagement officer who had actually helped me through my career decision. I had told her, I was like, I don't want to just do this. I don't want to just be a dietitian. There's so many things I'm interested in. Like, what do I do? And she ended up saying, maybe you should do communications. And through that, I just took advantage of the programs that are available to students at UBC like the co-op program and the work learn programs and also my continued volunteer work with the LFS faculty. Uh, and that's just given me a lot of experience in communications and marketing. And um, so that I was able to get a job in this field after I graduated. Um, and so as a digital marketing communication specialist, it's quite varied uh, depending on what kind of company you work for, or what kind of industry you work in. Um, for myself, I work at a creative agency um, and so we function more as kind of consultants and consultants are just people who kind of specialize in something and then they solve a problem for for the person that they work for uh, and then they get paid for it. So that's kind of how I function right now. Um, so I support clients specifically in social media. I do some website management, paid campaigns and, and anything else marketing related. And um, so that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Marielle. Um, I'll open the, the floor for any questions that you ha may have about her career or any um, FNH related questions. I'll just give that a minute or two. What do you market? Um, so for the clients in our agency, we actually, it actually aligns perfectly with the values that a lot of people from LFS have, um, which is we work on health promotion campaigns. So it's to better, sorry? No, I didn't oh, did someone say something? Oh, okay. So um, for example, the recent one was a really cool project that we've been bragging about for forever, but we got to work with BC Cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and in NBC and we did their health promotion campaign where we kind of like let people know like hey here's how alcohol is related to cancer and we kind of just help them create like a really design like very designy campaign something that caught people's attention and we made this whole quiz for them where they get to put in how many drinks they drink per week and then they get to see and as part of the people that kind of put something together like here are all the channels that we want to reach people through that we think that will help um, reach people. And then so they can take advantage of this quiz and assess their own risk. So we do kind of campaigns like that. Um, and then I also help uh, market our own agency as well. That's great. Thank you for sharing. I can now, a lot of FNH students, I'm an advisor for FNH. So they ask me, what can I do with my FNH degree? Um, and I have some responses, but I haven't had a, I haven't been telling them about communications and marketing. So now I now can share that with them as another possibility for them. Awesome. Thank you, Marielle. Um, one last question for you. What is a piece of advice you'd give to the prospective students attending today? When I heard your question um, first uh, earlier, I was like, I felt like I should mark it LFS. Um, for prospective students, I think, you know, it's great that you already showed up in, um, for today's session. I think there's a lot that's been offered in today's session that will give you a great insight of 
what you're doing, but it's more in line with what Shakti just mentioned earlier, which is just try things. Don't be afraid to try. And I think that's Elephas is a great place to and just plugging Elephas constantly. But I think F and H and the faculty is in general a great place to do so. You might find that other faculties are really big. And this is the feedback that I've heard from my other peers as well who have graduated from other faculties like the Faculty of Science. Um, if this is if there are areas in LFS that interest you, you'll find a lot of big support system here. And you might even end up in a career that's completely different from what your degree is. And we have a lot of support and a lot of um, perspective that's, that's introduced to the students that we have, even just outside of this session here. And so I think just open yourself up to possibilities. Don't be too married to your degree. It can change and it's okay if it changes. You can choose to finish it all the way through. You can choose to switch. Like I also went from science, right? Or it was just like, yeah, okay. And then she so came into LFS. So there, there's that, just try everything, be open. Thank you so much for sharing, Muriel. All right, moving on to the very last uh, faculty member. Uh, today we have Professor Hengston, and she is one of the professors of LFS that teaches uh, a lot of the food science courses that we offer. And so I'll pass the floor on to her. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for your interest in our faculty. Uh, yes, I teach four courses, um, all in food science. So I teach a large enrollment food microbiology course that F and H majors are required to take. So if you're in F and H or, or pursuing that, you'll probably have me as a professor at some point. And then I teach three laboratory courses for only food science students. Um, and I'm also the academic advisor for F and H and involved in lots of different things within the faculty. I am an assistant professor of teaching. So a lot of people are not aware of this position, um, including myself until I applied for it. But um, we're all aware of professors who have research programs where students or graduate students are working in a laboratory and um, conducting science. And my research is different. I actually research how to improve student learning in the classroom. So I have a research component, but my research component of my career is focused on helping you learn better. And I also do a lot of work with food science curriculum. So trying to design them most effectively to prepare food scientists for the future of food that they're going to be challenged with when they get out into the workforce. So those are my areas of, of research. Uh, right now, I'm currently researching the impacts of multi-access delivery on student learning. So in my large enrollment food microbiology course, I'm teaching both in person and on Zoom at the same time. And I'm studying the potential impacts to students learning if they choose to attend virtually as opposed to in person. So I'm very interested to see what those results will be in December when the students complete the surveys. And that's it for me for now, but feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, Professor Hingston. I'll open the floor up to any questions that you may have, uh, possibly relating to food sciences. If anyone is interested, please put your answers in the chat. I'll give it a minute or two. Or any random questions about professors, I can also answer. I had um, Professor Hingston for um, FNH three one three. Actually, I really enjoyed your course. Thank you. I remember you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very packed with information. I remember learning some of the things that would apply to my own home, like food hygienic practices. I remember learning some of the things, and I was like, "Oh man, I have to, I have to remember all of these viruses from my own, from my own knowledge." Because now I know that when I go out to the oysters. Yeah, are the things I love I, oysters too. These fresh oysters. I know now I, I have to think about all the things I learned in, in class, which is both interesting and also slightly terrifying. I know but it I shakes it. up your world a little bit. I've got some questions here privately. It says, do you have to get a PhD to be a prof? The answer to that is yes. 
Um, to be a professor, you do have to have a PhD, but to be a lecturer or an instructor, you do not have to have a PhD, um, though commonly people have a master's, but there's even some circumstances if someone has a lot of industry experience, you can also become a lecturer. So you can lecture at the university without a PhD, but if you want to be a full-time professor with a permanent position, you do have to have a PhD. And it's been mentioned that FNH is a small faculty. How many students are typically in first year? Well, LFS, Land and Food Systems, is the faculty. FNH is the program. And then within that, there's different majors. Um, there are about 200 FNH majors per year. And um, maybe, uh, Bree, you, you have faculty numbers, maybe? I'm not sure about total faculty numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So total in our faculty, we have about 1800 student undergraduate students in total in our faculty. And then in any given year, um, first year students, we usually have around 500 um, to 600 first year students coming in um, around 300 or so are usually FNH um, students. So new um, FNH students in our faculty. Thank you. I have another question here. It says, is there an interview before going into the FNH faculty? Do you mean for me or for you? Um, if you're talking about students, no, there is no interview for you to join the faculty. But FNH again is the program, um, and but there's also no interview for joining the LFS faculty. Um, for me, yes, there was a very lengthy interview process to get me into the faculty, involving giving four different talks of an hour each and uh, spanning two days so thank you for sharing professor hingston uh one last question for you is what is a piece of advice you'd give to prospective students attending today my main piece of advice is make yourself known to your professors. I tell this to my students all the time because especially if you're going into the FNH program, if there's 300 students per year and in my food microbiology course, I'm struggling with this at the moment is I'm getting asked probably by 30 students in the last week alone to write a reference letter for graduate school. Um, and if I don't know you, I don't feel very honest about writing a reference letter if I don't even remember who you are. So if you do plan to go on to graduate studies, even if you uh, want to apply for a job, they also ask for references. You're going to need references for scholarships, graduate studies, and a job in the future. And it's really good to start collecting those references during your degree. And it can be as simple as answering questions during class. Uh, asking questions. The students who ask questions during my class, I recognize their faces and I remember their faces. If you don't participate in class in any kind of way, I usually don't remember you and then I have to turn down your request to write a reference letter. Um, so get to know your professors, make yourself known through even different clubs and opportunities and just put yourself out there, which was advice that was also given earlier today. Um, don't be, don't be afraid, get involved and make yourself known. Uh, is it, I have a, is it possible to do a double degree in FNH and psychology? I, I don't think you can, but I will leave that to experts. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, so no, unfortunately not. So we don't have um, the only double degrees that we have are the um, the double degree that Shakti um, completed in uh, FNH and education. So that's two degrees, one in education, one in FNH. Um, the other one um, that we have is uh, through our partnership with um, Sauter, where students go on to a master in management um, after completing um, one of the programs in our faculty. Um, however, if you're interested in the field of psychology, um, there are a couple different ways to do that. So we do have minors. Um, minors are really good options to integrate other um, interest areas into your degree. So many students with another um, area of interest or um, with skills that they want to explore will add a minor to their degree. You can do a minor in psychology, uh, for instance. Um, another idea is that within the um, food, nutrition and health 
major in particular. Um, there is a lot of elect elective possibilities. Um, we do definitely have a lot of social science um, related electives that are possibilities for our students to explore and, and bring in some of those social sciences into their uh, food, nutrition, and health degree. No problem. All right. Hey. So thank you, uh, Professor Hingston, for sharing that. And I'll pass it on to Bree to talk about um, quick admission information to our faculty. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you, Ayasha. So um, on to um, some questions that are uh, very common um, uh, for students, or especially around this time of year. Um, what do I need to think about uh, for admission into the program? Um, so the information uh, that you see here, so this is for um, BC high school students. Um, so as I mentioned, we are a we have science degrees uh, in our faculty. Um, so the requirements for our programs actually do align with what you see in the Faculty of Science. Um, so at minimum for grade 11 requirements, uh, we need students to have completed uh, pre-calculus um, 11 or foundations math uh, 12, um, English 11 or English 11 first peoples um, and chemistry 11 and physics 11. Uh, for grade 12 requirements, um, everybody um, will need to complete pre-calculus 12. Um, we often get a question of um, whether or not calculus is, is required or not. It is not uh, required uh, for admission into the program, but it's very helpful. Um, you will be taking calculus courses uh, in your first year. So um, if you do end up taking calculus in high school, it will benefit you uh, when you uh, go on to your courses in your first year. Um, you'll need English uh, 12 or English 12 First Peoples. Um, and then you'll need one of Biology 12, Chemistry 12, or Physics 12. Again, my recommendation, especially as an academic advisor, is um, the more that you can do um, during your high school years, the better. And it'll really um, assist you in those years um, when you come into the FNH program. Um, if you don't take Biology 12 or Chemistry 12, um, or uh, physics 12 for certain majors, um, and I'll go into that, um, then you will uh, have to take an additional course at UBC, uh, which will be above and beyond your degree requirements in order to get you there. So you will need to take um, that course eventually, um, but it's just not only one of those is required for admission. Um, for physics 12, if you are thinking about majoring in food, nutrition and health, the general major, or if you are thinking about dietetics, um, physics 12 isn't actually going to be required for you. Um, so that is one that if you're thinking, do I do physics 12? Do I not do physics 12? Um, that one you could leave off. But if you're thinking nutritional sciences, food science, food science and nutritional sciences double major, or if you want to leave your options open, all of those sciences um, will definitely benefit you. Um, application deadline uh, for everyone is uh, January 15th, but if you want to be considered for early admissions and scholarships, um, so entrance scholarships, um, then you'll want to consider um, definitely submitting your application by December 1st. And I see some questions starting to roll into the chat. We're really close to our Q&A period, so I might just leave those until the Q&A period. Okay, so going into, um, so if you're coming in as a, a post-secondary student, so if you're currently in um, a post-secondary institution, um, either a college or a university, um, so admission requirements um, are same on the previous end. So we still need you to meet the high school minimum requirements. Um, the courses that you saw listed previously, you would still need to have those completed um, in your high school or have taken equivalent courses at whatever post-secondary institution you are currently attending. Um, your admission uh, into the program. So um, for high school students, uh, when you apply for admission, we'll be asking you to also submit a personal profile, um, which explains um, why you're um, wanting to join the program and a little bit about yourself. Um, for transfer students coming in, um, your entire admission is going to be based on your most recent 24 to 30 credits of coursework. And there's no personal profile that will be required 
in your application. Um, so it'll be primarily based on what you did in your um, previous uh, post-secondary work. Um, and if you are curious, um, so we will use uh, courses that are transferable into our programs. Um, the BC Transfer Guide is an amazing resource um, to explore. Okay, does the core, do the, any of the courses that I took previously at my previous institution transfer um, to UBC? And then if any of those are degree requirements for you, you wouldn't be required to complete them again once you are in the FNH program. Um, and in order to be competitive, um, we typically recommend for students coming in from post-secondary institutions specifically um, to be aiming for a mid 70s um, or higher um, overall average um, percentage wise. And same application deadlines. Okay, so we often uh, get the question um, because when you do apply into UBC and LFS, we have four different programs in our faculty. So how do you choose uh, which program um, that you select in your application process? So some other ideas, you've already taken a really great first step today by attending today's session. Um, so that's great. If you are torn um, kind of between some of the programs that we offer in LFS, I'd encourage you to attend some of the other Taste of LFS sessions that are going on this week. Um, so we'll be having another um, LFS info session um, and uh, one for our applied biology program. Um, there's also a lot of really great resources online on our website. Um, so you can explore the information that we have on our website. Um, we have a lot of really great um, alumni and student profiles there to get some additional perspectives on all of our programs. Um, we'd really encourage you to think about choosing a degree that really matches um, with what you want to study and what you are interested in. That is the most important thing and that, that's what's going to drive your motivation throughout your entire degree. Um, if you're curious about the admission requirements and whether or not you meet them, of course, that's going to be a, a minimum barrier of entry. Um, so the u.ubc.ca website, um, that's a website that's managed by our colleagues in UBC admissions. It's an amazing resource, um, lots of information there on admission requirements and um, what the process is to apply. Um, and then our colleagues in UBC um, recruitment and admissions, um, they also hold other events and presentations. So if you're curious about other degree programs um, across UBC, um, please consider exploring those and you'll find a lot of really great information again on that u.ubc.ca uh, website. Okay, um, so that concludes our uh, session and our